Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regaming to the Com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with some benchmarks which have leaked onto the internet from Coffee Lake processors of the mobile variety. Then we'll discuss some performance results of the Intel Hades Canyon NUC, which sports an 8th generation Core i7-8809G CPU, and of course the RX Vega M GPU. Then we'll finish the video off with some good news, and that is Intel have updated its list of fixed processors for the Spectre bug by adding in Haswell and Broadwell, or if you prefer, the 4th and 5th generation of core Intel CPUs. Coffee Lake Mobile, however, is going to kick us off, and we have a list of performance results on Geekbench, which of course is an extremely popular benchmarking database slash tool. So there are actually three different entries here. We have two different Quanta, I think that's how you pronounce that systems, and they are running the i7-8750H, and we also have a HP system as well. I'll start out things first with the HP Pavilion laptop, which is scoring 4980 in single core, uh, 19,402 in multi-core, and then the Quanta NL5T scores 4,700, and then 17,504 in single core and multi-core respectively. And finally, the NL5T, which scores 5,008 with a multi-core score of very impressive, actually, 20,715. So, what level of context here? Well, something along the lines of an i7-7700HQ scores about 4,100, maybe 4,000, 4,200, something along those lines in single uh, thread tests. But with multi-threading thrown in, it's going to score the high 12,000s to maybe low 14,000s. Obviously, it depends on what the mother, uh, sorry, what the laptop manufacturer has done with the cooling and other solutions. So what we're looking at here is about 20% improvement in single thread performance, but up to 50%, slightly less than that, in multi-threaded. Rolling through the specifications for a moment, we have the topology, really I can't speak today, that's one processor of course, because one socket, 6 cores, 12 threads, the base frequency of 2.2 GHz, which means of course the minimum clock speed, turbos up to a fairly arbitrary number actually, 4.09 GHz, it is, of course, Coffee Lake, 32 kilobytes level 1, uh, 32 kilobytes um, level 1 data, level 2 cache is 256 kilobytes, and all of those are times 6, so of course that's per core, and finally level 3 cache of 9 megabytes. Okay, so what gives? Why the hell is there such a gulf between the results? After all, the NL5T, which scores 4700, is way slower than NL5T, which scores 5008. And then you've got the middle of the pack, which is the HP Pavilion, which scores once again uh, 4980 and 19,402, respectively. Well, there's probably multiple different reasons, and you can probably guess some of them. One is different memory configurations. How much memory? What speed is the memory? What BIOS revisions? Are they still pretty early? What, what about the cooling? Because really, that's going to be kind of the key characteristic here. The key thing is turbo means it will turbo up to that speed, providing there's no other hindering factors. So, for example, it has the battery life. For example, it has the thermal room to do it. So, in some instances, if you have a particularly poorly cooled laptop, or perhaps it's summer in maybe poor ventilation, maybe your laptop will only run at like 3 gigahertz. But if you're in the middle of the Antarctica with a really good uh, cooling situation going on, then maybe you'll hit 4.1 gigahertz. Obviously, being a little silly, but you kind of get where I'm going with this. Either way, the scores are very impressive indeed, at least in my opinion. The 9 megabytes of level 3 cache, however, is still less than the 8700K for the desktop, which, just for those of you who don't know, has 12 megabytes of level 3 cache, but also the turbo frequency is considerably higher, as well as the base frequency. You look at it 3.7 and 4.7 for the base and turbo respectively. But then again, it also has a higher power consumption. 
Next up, we're going to discuss some performance results from a website by the name of Playwares when they were testing Intel's Hades Canyon NUC, which once again features the 8th generation core processors and combines that with AMD's RX Vega. The Hades Canyon NUC is actually running the i7-8809G and will be priced at around the thousand US dollar mark. Small thing, I'm not going to include all of their benchmarks because that would be unfair but you can check them out in the link in the video description but I will be going through some of the more pertinent ones and I'd also like to thank Abdul who emailed this to me which is at paul at redgamingtech.com. So first of all let's go over the basics of this thing. The uh, Hades Canyon, can I just please call it the NUC, runs at 3.1 gigahertz base clock 4.2 gigahertz boost 8 megabytes level 3 cache, 4 cores, 8 threads, and perhaps the thing that freaked out most people on the internet, as well as the tech world in general, and probably mean that they're expecting cats and dogs to start marrying one another, is AMD's Radeon RX Vega was the ace in Intel's deck, because it's actually combined with 4 megabytes of HBM2, and that runs at 1.6 GBPS, and the entire package, including the CPU, the GPU, the HBM, and all of that stu shiny stuff, is 100 watts. And on top of all of that, all of, the, all of the components can actually be overclocked, and this even includes the HBM. So the GPU has 1,536 shaders, or 24 compute units, and runs at a base clock, um, or so I say, the, a boost clock of 1,190 megahertz. Oh, and I guess I should also mention that the memory bandwidth at default is 204.8 gigabytes per second. Now, according to Playwares, they did actually manage to play around with it. Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. And they actually did a fairly decent job of overclocking it as well. They managed to get the CPU to 4.3 gigahertz and the HPM went up to 1300 megahertz. I'm sorry, the GPU was overclocked to 1300 megahertz and the HPM went up to 950 megahertz. Okay, enough of that crap. What about the performance? I hear you scream at me. Well, actually pretty damn good. Um, we'll stop, as I said, I won't go through all the games and all the benchmarks because that would be unfair. You can check out that article, but we will go through enough to build up a good picture of this. So Rise of the Tomb Raider, very popular benchmark indeed, uh, and game, very good game. Uh, with defaults and overclocks, we get uh, 45.36 or 50.05. This being on 1080p Ultra. Metro 2033 at 1440p. Very high preset, 32 frames per second average at default. Overclocked, you get 36.62. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't particularly struggle with Overwatch 1080p with Epic. Minimum frame rate on 54. Average of 65. Overclocked, however, it absolutely smashes the minimum. 64 frames per second and an average of 81. Slightly more challenging, however, is Total War Warhammer 2. Minimum frames per second 23, average 27. Overclocked, however, these frames per second go up by about 3, so the average goes to 30.1. Finally, for gaming, I'll also mention Assassin's Creed Origins, which is a pretty demanding game. 1080p Ultra again, 34 frames per second average. Overclocked makes a huge difference, uh, 40 frames per second. Okay, well, none of that stuff's important. The most important thing, of course, is Fire Strike. What about, what about the results there? Well, we have Normal, Extreme, and Ultra. The Normal is 10,147 versus Overclock of 11,357. Extreme Overclock is just a smidgen under 5,000, and Ultra is 2,500. Of course, being realistic, the most important benchmark in the history of humanity is Cinebench. Yes, I'm being a bit silly, but still. And that, we see a... Fairly impressive score. Default is 180 for single. Uh, Multi-core, 866. Not a big difference with overclocking here. After all, it was not exactly like a 500 megahertz overclock here. Uh, 184 for the single core. 887 for multi. And finally, Geekbench 4.2, 64-bit. Uh, I'm not going to read the overclock score. I'm just going to read the default. 5,268 for single, 17,183 for the multi-core, and the OpenCL score is 84,997. Ooh, so close, so close to getting an 85,000, but not quite the cigar. 
I admit it's not particularly a product that I would buy and use, but it's a pretty cool product regardless. And it certainly could have some interesting ramifications, like for example, for a really good emulation machine, or perhaps a decent gaming machine, like a like a you know portable LAN machine, or perhaps even some creative stuff as well. You know what I mean. Personally, I would probably rather have a laptop-based uh, solution. That's just my personal opinion. But the performance results are definitely very impressive, and visual quality is also very impressive as well. It's certainly better than what you can get on most consoles at the moment, at least the base models. And it, if nothing else to me, shows a very good indication of what type of performance we might get out of Intel's future projects, perhaps even when we see it integrating its own discrete GPUs in the future, although we can presume they're going to eventually start ramping up the number of compute units or whatever they decide to call their particular architecture. Finally, Spectre has now received an all-new patch for the 5th and 4th generation of Intel Core processors. So once again, that's Haswell for the 4th generation and Broadwell for the 5th generation. So what does this mean? Well, it means essentially that now you will no longer get to be vulnerable to Spectre. So that's a good thing. Unfortunately, there is one more step, and that is, of course, you need to update your BIOS. And that's really where the step becomes a bit of a doozy because it's now down to actually the vendors themselves, whether that's a system vendor, so that would be the Dells of the world or whomever, or the motherboard vendors, so that would be the Asus's and the MSI's, to actually release that patch, customize it, release that patch for their specific hardware that you have bought. The other issue is that performance does degra degradate, excuse me, when using older silicon. So essentially, if you're using a 2016 or newer PC, so let's say Skylake, Kaby Lake, you get the idea. Well, it's not so bad. Uh, performance is not such a big deal. But if you're using an older processor, especially if it's Windows 7 or Windows 8, so older processor would be Haswell or older, then you're definitely going to notice a system performance decrease in certain tasks. And the reason that the older processors were hit harder than the newer processors is that the newer processors were using refined instructions and improvements in branch speculation to be more specific and why Windows gets punished if you're using an older version is because Windows 7 and 8 have more user kernel transitions so even things such as font rendering takes place in the kernel this means essentially that the system is doing more work by constantly switching, which is one of the areas that Spectre and Meltdown patches essentially affect performance in. Now, whether you choose to patch or not is down, of course, totally to you. My personal opinion is most users, especially if you're gaming, will only notice 1 or 2% performance drop. And, well, I don't know about you, but even if I drop 5% in performance from the CPU, it's not going to make much of a big deal. Like, if I was getting 72 frames a second, I may now get, like, 70, 67, or whatever. And I'd probably rather have that, on average, than need to worry about, let's say, I don't know, major security breaches. With that said, of course, as usual, that is a decision which it lays on your shoulders, not mine. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.